once in a lifetime there is loss So unmistakably unfair Too much for one to ever bear There is a darker shade than grief There is a deeper heart than that his wishes be served. We must allow John and Fanny to provide for us, as was surely Papa's intention. Three thousand pounds! Are you absolutely sure that was his intention? It was my father's dying wish to me that I should assist Eleanor and Marianne. Surely he did not stipulate a particular sum, my sweet. No, he did not. He left that to my judgment. Well then. Perhaps we can come to a more practical understanding. It is certainly unpleasant to have yearly drains to one's income. We should encourage their independence, should we not? My dearest Fanny, how utterly generous you are. And how utterly unruly the estate has become. The painting on the ceiling of Diana by Casali loudly clashes with the candlesticks and Japanese Venetians and the statue of Apollo is appalling in the entrance hall. It should be moved into the dining room where one can comprehend it all. White hall and spring blinds with brass corner plates. All the big towers, but it must be arranged. This will never do, it has to be just perfect, darling. We'll renew the dinner where and trim the manicured lawn. But nothing is exactly ever really perfect, darling, until the Miss Dashwood have gone. Is it not enough that we have lost the one person we most cherished in all the world? Now we must give up Norland. It seems unusually cruel. From father to son, he is the rightful descendant. Why? Because he is a man or because he is deserving? I find him neither. It is the law. The law. John is already provided for by his mother's fortune and Fanny's inheritance. Now he means to take our home from us. I am sure he will do what is fair and honorable. I am sure he will not marry her. He is family. Family can be such a burden. <laughs> to be tied down to the regular payment of such a sum is by no means desirable. Perhaps it would be better for all parties if the sum we settled on were diminished to uh, 500 pounds? You have such a generous spirit, my sweet. What brother on earth would do half so much for his half-blood sisters? They can hardly expect more. And there's no telling what they expect. But we're not to think of their expectations. The question is, what can you afford? I'm convinced your father never meant to give them money. We could help them pack their own belongings out of respect. That should be enough to satisfy your father's wishes. How much more could one expect? Perhaps we could send them presents of fish and game. Yes, fish and game. I hadn't thought of that. We do them a favor by releasing them from the burden of wealth and property. Do you mean to say I cannot take the goose feather bed? It's my goose feather bed! Yes, but we could not. And the tea service! Marianne, it was mother's. Norland is John and Fanny's now. Darling, this is simply too much. We still have each other. She cannot take that away. Yes, but how will we endure each other when we have no income? We will manage. I hope for your sake you are right. 
I am sure I will be even more disagreeable when I'm poor. It's not a miracle we need, but an act of human kindness. Agreed, dear sister. But miracles are scarce, and kindness is forgotten. And we're expected to flutter and fly away. Our outlook is not entirely gloomy. Yes, if we're gentle and subdued, then someone may take pity. Or someone may have a generous spirit. If it's submission they expect, they'll be surely disappointed. And I will suffer most gladly and cry your tears. For not even wine or words or lavender drops will ease the hurt. Miss Dashwood, how delightful to see you again. No, no, that's wrong. Mustn't say delightful. Sad occasion. Uh, good afternoon, Miss Dashwood. I'm so sorry for your tremendous loss. Your father will be greatly missed by those who knew him. That's not bad. Uh, good afternoon, Miss Dashwood. I'm so sorry for your tremendous loss. Your father will be greatly missed by those who knew him. I find myself stirred by fond memories of your father, as well as our agreeable walks through the gardens of Norland. Oh, I like where this is going. Where we'd spend hours discussing Rousseau and Voltaire. Oh, come, man. This isn't about you. They've just lost their father, and you're rehearsing your lines. How pathetic. Be natural. Speak from your heart and comfort her and say... Mr. Ferris. Ah! Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Miss Dashwood, good afternoon. Uh, that is, I mean to say... It's uh, lovely to see you. Yes, it is delightful. To, mm, mustn't say delightful. Uh, Mr. Ferris? Forgive me. I had something rather significant and profound to say to you, but now I've entirely forgotten what it was. I'm sure it was very elegant and moving. Dear Miss Dashwood, how can I receive my orders if I cannot even comfort a friend? You are of great comfort to me, Mr. Ferris, and will be of comfort to others. You are the only person who believes so. Then it is quite fortunate that I am right. When I heard the news, I... I was devastated. Marianne is overcome. And you, Miss Dashwood? I am counsellor to my sister. I have not the opportunity for such indulgence. Indulgence is not always an adversary. Spoken like a man who will one day inspire others. Oh, not if my sister Fanny or my mother have anything to say about it. I do not always feel that they have your best interests at heart. Edward, there you are. You see, dear, I told you he was in the study. We have pleasant news. Tomorrow night, Mother has arranged for us to dine with the Honorable Miss Morton, the only daughter of the late Lord Morton. <laughs> I don't know who the Mortons are I doubt they have nobility And Miss Morton, I'm sure, must have fine gentility But that is not my sensibility Eleanor, often a quandary Always a wonder all my failings knows how I blunder and all my love goes unexpressed am I repressed or am I cautious or merely fly 
Of course, I have no wish to offend the late Lord Morton or any of his descendants. Good. Good. Come, Edward. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meets in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to that tender light, which heaven to gaudy day denies. Shelley? Byron! I hear he's having an affair with Lady Caroline, but is now being forced to marry her cousin. <laughs> Why do poets lead such scandalous lives? <laughs> to sell books. <laughs> you missed lunch. Again. Did I? Sorry. You cannot keep dining with the servants. I will not eat at the same table as her. I lay my life that your obligations are now complete. The time has come for them to find a house of their own. If we must leave Norland, we should do it with propriety and decorum. I have no patience for propriety and no use for decorum. We have assisted them long enough. Why should we suffer the burden of their misfortune? That is because you do not know how to govern your feelings. At least I have feelings to govern. For which you show no moderation. The advantages of moderation have been highly overestimated. <laughs> Can they not see we have only their best interests at heart? We must begin making preparations. Why? It cannot be what Papa intended. Apparently, our maintenance for six months was all he required of our dear brother. I know John has a heart. It's just that no one can find it. I agree, my love. Freeing the girls from the memories of this estate is the kindest thing we can do for them. Indeed. Mm. And I do not like the regard that my brother Edward pays to Eleanor. They are getting much too well acquainted. In truth, you will be sorrier to leave Norland than I. Me? Why would I be sorrier? Mr. Ferris? Mr. Ferris. I cannot imagine what he sees in her. <laughs> I don't think that's for you to imagine, my love. I do not take your meaning. You're attached to him. I find his observations to be just and correct. But that's it. He has always been most kind to me and those around him. But does he enslave your passion? find him thoughtful. Does he leave your heart breathless? He has very good manners. Do you long to be with him? He has fine taste in music and I rather esteem him. <laughs> you esteem him. Esteem is perfectly respectable. Esteem is what you have for your grandfather. Express what you're feeling. Do you suffer? Do you want him more than you ever thought you could want before? Does he shake your soul to the very core? Can you feel it? Can you see it rise? Does it take your breath? Does it burn your eyes like a deadly sin, like October skies? Love's a wonder. Love is nothing we know. Love can carry you away. So the poets say, Come. 
Dashwood, Miss Dashwood. We were not expecting you. Yes, Fanny insisted upon my return. It seems there are some important documents in need of my review. Hmm, did you suddenly become a lawyer, Mr. Ferris? I'm afraid I never did. I was entered at Oxford and have been properly idle ever since. <laughs> and how was your trip to London? It was not particularly agreeable. Found a bit of trouble, did you, Edward? <laughs> I'm afraid the only trouble with me, Miss Dashwood, is that I'll never get into Parliament. Disgracing the family name. Mother can't be proud. Indeed. I am a huge disappointment to her. It seems I have not the wish to converse with the great men of the day. Fortunately, my younger brother Robert shows far more promise. Yes, likewise in our family, it is the older sister that occupies the position of greater promise. Would you not agree, Mr. Ferris? Marianne. I'm merely making an observation. And when do you return to London? Tomorrow, I'm afraid. Oh, so soon. You should have a profession, Mr. Ferris. You are such a busy man for one so idle. I always preferred the church, but that was not smart enough for my family. They recommended the army, but that was a great deal too smart for me. I think you would look rather dashing with a red coat on your back. No, no. Would you not agree, dear sister? I believe Mr. Ferris can decide for himself what sort of coat he wears. Perhaps he does not care to have a profession. Well, and How I... is your fame to be established? How will you become distinguished? Oh, I hope I never shall be, thank heaven. I cannot be forced into genius and eloquence. You have no ambition, then? I wish to be happy. Is that not ambition enough? I believe one's own happiness is the best reward one can hope for in this world. Yes, I would agree, Miss Dashwood. And it is always the most pleasing form of pleasure when one finds it among friends. Now we're getting somewhere. There is nothing I would not do for those who are truly my friends. Oh, I have little doubt of that, Miss Dashwood, for you are indeed. I am indeed. Oh, uh, uh, the, the, the most. Um... Yes, this could be a while. <laughs> oh, dear. Perhaps I should attend to Fanny. Uh, if you'll excuse me, Miss Dashwood. <laughs> Miss Dashwood. <laughs> Mr. Ferris. Well, if you are not engaged to him already, it is certainly soon to be so. Engaged? You cannot be serious. Why shouldn't you be engaged to him? You are forgetting that I am neither a woman of rank nor of fortune. He seems rather unconcerned with either distinction. Yes, but his mother and sister will not be. Eleanor, he loves you. Isn't it obvious? Anyone would be fortunate to share his affection. But further than friendship, you must not believe. In a shimmer, a friendship's gone While a love affair can go on and on An exhausting state you can depend upon In the glimmer, there's a ray of light To amaze your heart on a sleepless night Are you brave enough to embrace delight? offers us a small cottage in Barton Park. In Devonshire? Isn't that what you desired? Such a distance. How small? The rent is uncommonly moderate. Ah, so quite small. <laughs> we have no right of objection. There is always a right of objection. But I'm sure it will suit us. We will have very few servants. No matter. How few? Two maids and a man. Well, at least we'll be free of the evil witch. Marianne! 
How can you say such things? Words formulate in my head and then I say them out loud. <laughs> Don't be a child. Devonshire. But that's quite a distance. Yes, but you may come and visit us as often as you wish, Mr. Ferris. Yes, of course, but Devonshire, I must protest. Protest all you like, but unless you have a more suitable proposal, <laughs> we are soon to be your distant neighbors. Barton Park, I, I don't like it. I, I don't like it at all. And we are glad to hear it. We are so delighted for you both. <laughs> Thank you, Fanny. It'll be such a relief for you to have a house of your own, will it not? We had a house of our own, you may recall. Yeah. And Devonshire is so close. Oh, it's quite a distance, my love, don't you think? How splendid for everyone. You will see me in a fortnight, once you are settled. You will be most welcome, Mr. Ferris. Yes, well, you cannot expect too many visits from your friends at so great a distance. If my friends find no difficulty in traveling so far to see me, I am sure I will find none in accommodating them. Nor will I. Then it is settled. We will remain friends, <laughs> no matter the distance. Until when next we meet. Miss Dashwood. Favor our accord. Yes, as will I. Our exhilarating walks. Through the gardens of Norland. We cherished and adored. By myself as well. If you could know the man I see, the eldest son veiled in mystery. No, no, I. But we make our own history. Actually, I have something you quite will important. You find but... your voice. Well, I'm glad you think so because I. Hear a higher call. Yes, which brings me to my next subject. Your I... conscientious words. Yes, words. And Speaking of words. Us all. Well, I would like to shed some light on a particular situation. For you can learn how not to be the kind of man you are thought to. Well, who's the man I ought to be? Whoever you divide. As long as we are friends. Whomever you create. Then I shall be content. Just be the man you are. The distance we endure. Speak your mind and wait. Be my one lament. And I would walk the frozen morn. distant shores If once I'm there the face I see It is looking much improved, Mother. Don't dawdle! They'll be arriving soon. Well, well I, I think, think it's the least we can do after all that they've endured. They'll rest in a house with a view finally secured. Even so, it's the least we can do to restore their family name. They'll rest with a room with a view. We're so glad they came. It's as pretty as a picture, though quite smaller than imagined. As pretty as a picture and so drafty. Everything we wanted, and yet nothing is familiar. I'll try to find its charm. I'll try to love its flaws. It tends to give one pause. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Lord Middleton. <laughs> This is indeed a happy day. It was most generous of you, cousin. We can never thank you enough. Oh, no need. The arrival of new company is always a great joy to me, Miss Dashwood. <coughs> oh. May I introduce Mrs. Jennings, my late wife's mother. How do you do? Well, 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 such pretty girls. You will be a most welcome addition to the park. Thank you, Mrs. Jennings. We do hope so. I trust you've not left your heart behind in Sussex. No, just some furniture. 
yes, well, every pretty girl should have a husband. I will make it my personal mission to find suitable matches for you both if there's still time. Do not trouble yourself, Mrs. Jennings. We are in no particular hurry to form attachments. No, no, no hurry. Oh, oh my dear. No, by the look of you, it would seem to me you have very little reason to display such patience. <laughs> Perhaps they should join us for dinner tonight. Oh, an impeccable idea. Yes, you must. Oh, but we, we will not take no for an answer. <laughs> and I believe Colonel Brandon is free, is he not? I believe he is. Who is Colonel Brandon? Silent and grave, but in appearance not unpleasing. Cool and aloof, with a past. What kind of past? His countenance is sensible, his experience vast. Even for a man on the wrong side of five and thirty. Mrs. Jennings, the Miss Dashwoods are a delight, are they not? Oh, you are too old for her, I'm afraid. Too old for whom? Marianne Dashwood, though she is quite beautiful. <laughs> and uncommonly smart, with an appearance not unpleasing. Pity your youths passed you by. I'm 36. The lovely Miss Dashwoods are a gift to the eye, even if your best days are sadly behind you. Do not be in the continual terror of my decay, Mrs. Jennings. I'm feeling especially robust tonight. Yes, and anyone can see why. <laughs> Colonel, how are you enjoying the evening? I am enjoying it very much, Miss Dashwood, especially with the addition of new company. You are a long-time resident of Barton Park, then? Yes, very long. <laughs> I am, indeed. I have an estate at Delaford. Good. We must become frequent visitors. And what an estate it is. It will give him great comfort in his declining years. Again, not old. <laughs> Mrs. Jennings, it does not appear that Colonel Brandon is ready to succumb to old age just yet. Yes, it would certainly be rude of you to die before we've had the chance to get to know you a little. <laughs> well, according to Mrs. Jennings, I have long outlived every sensation and feeling. According to Mrs. Jennings, we are all very much past our prime. Speak for yourself. I am very much enjoying mine. Mm, as well you should, Miss Dashwood. Youth is inevitably fleeting. One should enjoy its pleasures, whilst one can. All this talk of age is making me depressed. Are there no other young people in Barton Park? I'm afraid not many. Well, Colonel, I am very glad to have made your acquaintance, even though you are likely to perish before the night is over. <laughs> I must apologize for my sister. She can be abrupt at times. No apology necessary. In fact, I once knew a young woman who, in temper and mind, greatly resembled your sister. Oh? But unfortunate circumstances befell her in a most unkind manner. Forgive me. Nothing to forgive. Marianne is perfectly capable of provoking the strongest feelings in the most tempered of dispositions. Yes. Yes, that well describes the young lady I was thinking of. Then I shall leave you to your thoughts, Colonel Brandon. My Lydia, my sweet departed, cherished friend, it seems I knew you once, so briefly now, it almost feels like centuries But Lydia, you're with me each and every day I hear your hollowed voice The promises we made at your last breath It's a little bit remarkable An accidental miracle That we were both together in this troubled world But miracles are fleeting Life is random circumstance And something everlasting never had a chance no, Lydia, we were cursed right from the start Between my father's greed, my brother's wrath My misbegotten place in life Why, Lydia, are some men good and some men cruel For who would harm a soul as kind as yours With barely no remorse An unintended consequence, an accidental casualty Of antiquated customs we've quite outgrown 
family is disregarded, cast out and thrown away by senseless, inconsistent laws we still obey. But I try to keep some grace. I try to see your face. But time has blurred the light. But Lydia, there's someone who reminds me of you. Lydia! I do not enjoy hearing men speak about flannel waistcoats. Who is speaking of flannel waistcoats? I overheard Colonel Brandon speaking to Mrs. Jennings. Must all manner of events be disagreeable to you? And we have been here for nearly a fortnight, and still Mr. Ferris does not come. He must be very ill. <laughs> or very occupied. Have patience, dear sister. How can you remain so calm, so composed? I'm sorry, what is it you would rather I feel? Despair! Outrage! Fury! I had better leave the fury to you. <laughs> we have lost everything, yet you feel nothing. I feel hungry. Have you eaten today? How can you speak of food? Are there muffins? <laughs> I believe John and Fanny have sent over some fish and game. Pathetic. I'm going for a walk. Now? It's about to come pouring down. All the better. Marianne. What? Don't make me come off to you. It's just a bit of rain. There are clouds on the summit. No need to be concerned. You will catch your death of cold. Drops of rain will wake me and renew my sense of wonder. We know how this ends. It's just a bit of rain. No need to be afraid. Rain, wash me clean, leave my soul unforeseen. Lose me on the downs. She has taken a fall on the downs. Thank goodness I came upon her. Darling, are you all right? I believe so. 
She should stay off that foot for a few days, I should think. Thank you greatly for what you have done, sir. Won't you sit down? No, I mustn't. And do let me apologize for the intrusion. Intrusion? You have practically saved her life. I'm just relieved she is not more seriously injured. Let me at least make you some tea. Thank you, no. But if you be so kind and allow me the honor of calling tomorrow to inquire after the young lady, I'd be very grateful. Yes, of course. But who are we to thank for this kind deed? The name's Willoughby. I'm staying at Allenham Court. Willoughby. <laughs> then you are nearby. Good news indeed. Well, we are most grateful to you, Mr. Willoughby, and we are most eager to see you again tomorrow. As am I. A good day to you, ladies. Why are men always so much more interesting when they depart so suddenly? <laughs> I will scold you later. It's just a bit of rain. His traveling coat was most becoming. That brings a ray of light. What's the use of scolding you at all? I'm sorry, did you say something? Isn't she wonder? Isn't she extraordinary? Willoughby here? Ah, oh, splendid. We must ask him to dine with us. You know him, then? Well, to be sure. He's down here every year. And what sort of man is he? <laughs> as good a fellow as ever lived. And I dare say there's not a bolder rider in all of England. But what are his pursuits, his talents, his genius? Upon my soul, I have no idea. <laughs> but who is he? Has he a house in Allenham, then? No, but his aunt does. A house he is one day to inherit. Until then, he remains under her governance. So he has no property of his own? No, but he's much well liked. Last Christmas, he danced from eight till four without once sitting down. That is what a young man ought to be. Whatever be his pursuits, his eagerness in them should know no moderation and leave him no sense of fatigue. Ah. I see how it'll be. You'll be setting your cap at him now and never think of poor Brandon. I deplore the phrase setting one's cap at a man. It is gross and illiberal. And why should I think of Colonel Brandon when there's... Willoughby. You don't know anything about him. Willoughby. Don't get ahead of yourself, Marianne. The weather has been most unpleasant, Mr. Willoughby. It must be difficult to ride the downs this time of year. I would happily ride a hundred miles through winter's chill to ensure that Miss Dashwood enjoys a perfect recovery. Ah, I see. <laughs> and how is your aunt? I hear she suffers from poor health. I hope she is not too confined by her ailments. She's as tough as a bull, I'm afraid. That is, she does not appear in danger of succumbing to her infirmity any time soon. Uh, but one is fortunate to have good relations. Would you not agree, Miss Dashwood? I know very little of the subject. Might I ask if you have any little interest in music, Mr. Willoughby? A great deal. Miss Dashwood, I'm quite passionate about music. I'm very glad to hear it. And you dance? I believe I am considered quite a seasoned dancer. <laughs> Most appealing. And do you have any interest in poetry? Oh, very much so. I am quite fond of Cooper and Scott. The star of love, all stars above, now reigns o'er earth and sky. And, and high and low, low the influence, influence now. now. But, but where, where is, is County, County Guy? Guy? <laughs> County who? <laughs> you recite with such sensitivity and spirit. Do you often say whatever you like? Without attention to persons or circumstances, do you display caution? Oh, not a whit. I have no use for propriety. I don't think she even knows the definition. I find it rather a bore myself. I abhor all concealment. There's no disgrace in being unreserved. I find all restraint of sentiment to be an unnecessary effort. Ah, I see common ground has been found. 
Perhaps we should change the subject before our behaviors become illustrations of our opinions. <laughs> I apologize for my sister Willoughby. She means to rescue me from my excesses. Let's hope she does not succeed. Sitting here can hear you. Well, I'm afraid I must return to my aunt. Thank you for your allowing me the honor of this visit. Uh, may I call again tomorrow to make sure the ankle is healing properly? You may, Willoughby. And every day after that. I shall look forward to the pleasure, ladies. He displays a want of caution, does he not? Willoughby. How will your acquaintance support the extraordinary dispatch of every subject? Willoughby. You will soon have exhausted each topic and have nothing further to discuss. Willoughby. Our tastes are strikingly alike. We are united in our frankness and our ease. Willoughby. His perfect breeding and affections are both all at once delightful and enchanting. Willoughby. I find him perfectly exciting. A man who can sense a work of art. He's exactly, precisely formed to engage my heart. Willoughby, Willoughby, Willoughby. I have not known him very long, and yet I'm absolutely sure I know him well. Willoughby, we read the same poetic passages, we hear the same rhapsodic intonations. Willoughby, a man accessible and clever, I can't imagine we will ever part. He's exactly, precisely, formed to engage my heart. Willoughby, Willoughby. His society is my best enjoyment. We read, we talk, we sing. And everything he does is so assured. Dancing and cards, I have the warmest regards for Mr. Willoughby. Mr. Willoughby. Mr. Willoughby. Marianne, the great amusements of the night provide the spark and find a light of who we are. I feel as though I've always been. Willoughby. We have the old familiar so feeling familiar. of a long established intimate acquaintance. With me, inside his quick yeah. imagination, there's always some intrinsic work of art. He's exactly, you have been precisely, for me, formed to engage my heart. seems to be getting along quite well with Mr. Willoughby. Yes, they have been inseparable these last few weeks. Uh, well, there is something so amiable about the prejudices of a young mind. And one is sorry to see them give way to the practicalities of age. I find Haydn's music far too formulaic. But he is considered <clears> the fun. <throat> uh, sorry, is it dinner yet? You're late. Am I? We went for a walk, and then Willoughby insisted we recite Ode on a Grecian Urn. I didn't insist. You insisted. I do not care for Keats so early in the day. This is fascinating. <laughs> but we are guests at Colonel Brandon's home, and I believe there are others in the room. Oh, oh let them be, Miss Dashwood. It's been so long since we've had a modicum of excitement at the park, and one does sometimes need actual events to substantiate the rumors one spreads. <laughs> I adore rumors, Mrs. Jennings. Would you care to honor us with your very best? Uh, her very best or her very latest. One hopes they will come to the same thing. Do not forget the better part of valor is discretion, Mr. Willoughby. In the which better part? I have saved my life. 
Falstaff, Henry IV, Act V, Scene Four. Oh, isn't he <laughs> splendid? <laughs> well, I don't know about Falstaff, but I do know about a lock of hair. Give us the details. What do you mean, a lock of hair? Well, I mean a lock of your hair, too, Mr. Willoughby. We have no secrets here, Miss Dashwood. None at all. <laughs> but I'm really more intrigued by E.F. Marianne. What have you told Mrs. Jennings? There is a young man who is Eleanor's particular favorite, whose initials, I'm told, are E.F. But of course you know this is an invention of your own and that there is no such person in existence. I know that now. <laughs> when is he to visit Miss Dashwood? Never. He does not exist. Tell him, Marianne. E.F. does not exist. May I have a biscuit? But what has really raised my interest is the issue of the horse. The horse. A gift, I'm told. Marianne, I was going to mention it. Can we have a horse? Her name is Queen Mab. Willoughby has promised to look after her. Can we? Colonel, is everything all right? I must apologize. It seems I'm being called away. No bad news, I hope. None at all, sir. It is merely a letter of business. But why has it so discomposed you if it is merely a letter of business? Mrs. Jennings. Perhaps we should trust the Colonel to know his own countenance. Come, let's hear the truth of it. Is it from her? It is business which requires my immediate attendance in town. Uh, Colonel, you can go to town tomorrow. Please stay. I wish that it could be so easily settled, Miss Dashwood, but I cannot delay my journey for even an hour. If you would let us know what your business is, we might see you whether... You must excuse be... me. My deepest apologies. I say, there are some people who cannot bear a party of pleasure. Shall we have some more sherry? What do we think it is, Mrs. Jennings? Oh, it is about Eliza, I'm sure. Who is Eliza? Oh, 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 you have not heard of her, I suppose. She is a relation of the Colonel's, my dear. A very near relation. We will not say how near for fear of shocking you, but she is his natural daughter. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, yes. And as like him as she can stare, I dare say the Colonel will leave her all his fortune. What a scandal. We do not as yet know the circumstances of Colonel Brandon's situation. Poor Brandon. He has everybody's good word, but nobody's notice. Oh, so true. <laughs> Don't be so hard on poor Brandon. He is a good man. Yes. He is the kind of man that everyone speaks well of, but nobody remembers to talk to. He has neither genius nor taste. His voice lacks expression. Or spirit. Marianne. <laughs> he deserves your admiration and your praise. Can you not see that your conduct to him is unbecoming? No, I'm sorry, but it is very difficult to concentrate on my bad behavior when Mr. Willoughby is standing so near. In a shimmer, like a flash of light, conventions break out of sheer delight. Will I wander free? Yes, I think I might. We're united in a sudden bond we did not expect or depend upon, and the old restraints are completely gone. Love is thrilling, love is nothing we know. Love will carry me away. You must take your time, come what may, seize the moment, seize the day. A delectable, delectable treat, treat with, with the, the girls in Barton Park. Park. Don't they have an attractive appeal past their prime? But smart, delicate, and delightful, they are merely next of kin. And they live in a house with a view finely settled in. They're as pretty as a picture. I see marriages and children. As, as pretty as a picture, time. and so charming. But it better happen quickly, they're, they're not getting, getting any younger. It's nice to have them here. They're glad to have our care. That, that is, is our cross to bear. Mr. Willoughby, 
This is a surprise. Good day, Miss Dashwood. Will you be staying with us long? No. In fact, I must take my leave of you. I won't hear of it. Tea. Where is Marianne? She went to her room. Is she ill? I dare say I hope not. She thinks nothing of walking in the rain for hours and then complains of all its symptoms. In truth, it is I who suffers most. Mr. Willoughby? I've been called away to London. London? When? At this very moment, my aunt has dispatched me on business. You're going to London now. So it would seem. This is most unfortunate. She will not detain you long, I hope. You are very kind, but I have no idea of when I might return. It is all at my aunt's discretion. I seem to live my life entirely as she wishes it. Oh, surely she is being unreasonable. Reason has little to do with it. Dear Mr. Willoughby, surely something can be done. Are we not the only home in Devonshire in which you are welcome? It is folly to linger in this manner. I will not torment myself any longer by remaining among friends whose society it is impossible for me now to enjoy, if you'll excuse me. Oh, dear. Marianne! Leave me alone! Oh, my darling, I am so sorry. Surely he will return to you. Do you not think so? I am besieged with despair. This is just temporary. So suddenly to be gone. It seems but the work of a moment. Yes, a very bad moment. Last night he was with us and so happy, so cheerful. Now he's gone forever. Or oh, he's gone for several weeks. Nothing more than an adjournment. My life has ended. I have nothing left. And while his absence is unfair, it's just an inconvenience. My world has crumbled and shattered. I die inside. Marianne, come back. Poor thing, nothing seems to do her any good. She hasn't eaten for a week. She doesn't dress, I barely see her. Give her time, she will recover. All she wants to do is cry. She doesn't sleep, she doesn't listen. And I can't reach her or teach her what she demands. And not even wine or words or lavender drops can heal the pain she's feeling. It's unfair, but she has lost, cannot be replaced, but we still have There she is, Mary Ann. Do have some dried cherries. Mm -mm -mm. Utterly delectable. Thank you, no. Well, just one. It would do you a world of good. I hardly think you would have any notion of what would do me a world of good, Mrs. Jennings. Mary Ann, that tone is uncalled for. You're right, dear sister. Forgive me, Mrs. Jennings. It is with great reluctance that I decline your offer to partake in the consumption of dried fruit. I look forward to future opportunities to indulge in other great culinary activities. I see. Well, perhaps I'll come back when you're feeling better. There is no need for that. Sorry, I'm not exactly at my best. Yes, but there's no need to be at your worst. She's always so meddlesome. Were it not for her and Lord Middleton, God knows where we would be. I suppose you are right. I just simply do not have the strength to be pleasant. That is why you must eat. I cannot. When Willoughby writes to you, you will need to have the strength to reply. But he has not written. But he will. He has just been unable to. Do you suppose he is injured? Or his hand is injured, therefore he could not write to me. And certainly anything is possible. Or, or perhaps his letter has been lost. And it's lying in the street unobserved. Well, I... what if he is lying in the street? Marianne. Eleanor, do you think he has forgotten me? No, dear sister. More likely he would have forgotten his own name before he would forget you. It's Willoughby! Eleanor, it's Willoughby! Ah! Hello? Mr. Ferris, I must say you are the only person in the world I would forgive for not being Willoughby. 
Willoughby, I... How very good it is to see you, Mr. Ferris. Come in. Did you come from London? No, I came from Norland, actually. Norland? What sensation must befall you walking in the woods of Norland, thickly covered with the signs of the season, delighting in nature's spirit? Sister, not everyone shares your passion for dead leaves. <laughs> And some share no passion for anything. If you'll excuse me a moment, Mr. Ferris. <laughs> well. Well. Miss Dashwood. Mr. Ferris. I think you will find this interesting, I think. Well, perhaps not so much interesting as uncomfortable. No, 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 that's wrong. Uh, let me rephrase. Um, several years ago, I... That is a lovely necklace, by the way. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> several years ago, you... Um, my dear Miss Dashwood, I have been most remiss. And there is not a day goes by that I do not consider. That is, that I do not mean to share with you a particular piece of information that I have neglected to impart. I, I would be most intrigued to hear what that is, Mr. Ferris. I, I have made a promise. I, um, that is. <laughs> uh, oh, this is interesting. Um, Voltaire once said, every man is guilty of the good he did not do. And Forgive me. You mentioned a promise and something you had neglected to impart. Actually, Miss Dashwood, I am ready to be candid. There are certain situations that may ah, need a little clarifying. If you had a moment, I could make myself understood. Well, I hope it won't offend you if I tell you that I wish you would. Yes. Truthfully, Miss Dashwood, you've been perfectly agreeable and, and altogether patient with my certain uncertainties and little ambiguities. How can I make amends? Hopefully, Miss Dashwood, this won't seem too audacious. I'm hopeless at discourse. You've always been gracious. So now allow this humble man. You may say anything you wish, Mr. Ferris. <laughs> To tell you plain, please tell me plain, once and for all. Yes, Mr. Ferris. I love your painted parasol. Is that all? <laughs> Mr. Ferris? Let me assure you, Miss Dashwood, there is nothing you can say. That's I'm, but I'm not worthy, Miss Dashwood. Let me as be I saying, I have such a high regard. You do? For you. For me. And all you do. And I know when someone is noble and fair. I trust you wholly as I breathe the air. But it might end up horribly. Middleton, I simply adore Barton Park, and you are such a gracious host. Why, thank you, my dear. Certainly. <laughs> what do you think of Miss Steele? She is beautiful, is she not? Indeed. And uh, very fashionable, to my taste? Yes, quite. And such an easiness of air about her? That does not, however, give her elegance. No, but it gives her a distinction of person. And though she has no education, she's smart enough to get what she wants. And what is that? She's such a sly little creature, there's no finding out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Dashwood. 
Edward. How are you enjoying Devonshire? I suppose you are sorry to leave Sussex. I enjoy Devonshire very much. Norland is beautiful, I hear. Lord Middleton speaks of it frequently and admires it excessively. <clears throat> I hear your sister is attached to a very suitable and handsome young gentleman. From whom would you hear such a thing? Oh, it will be a fine thing to have her married, so young. Honestly, I don't know what you are speaking of. I hope you can have as good of luck yourself. Although, perhaps you have a friend in the corner already. A friend in the corner? Miss Dashwood, can I be frank with you? I know our acquaintance has been very short indeed. A little under a minute, I would think. <laughs> but I feel as though I can confide in you. My, your trust is quickly earned. Would you object if I asked you quite a forward and personal question? Very much so. <laughs> Are you acquainted with your sister-in-law's mother, Mrs. Ferris? Fanny's mother, good heavens, no. I've never had the pleasure. Perhaps you can tell me what sort of woman she is? To be candid, Miss Steele, I know nothing of her. I hope you don't think me impertinent, Miss Dashwood. To be candid, Miss Steele, I don't know what to think. I never understood that you were at all connected with the family. <gasps> the time may come that I may be intimately connected. Good heavens, are you referring to Robert Ferris? No. I've never met Mr. Robert Ferris. It is his elder brother, Edward, whom I am acquainted with. Edward? I have a great secret which I must share with you, Miss Dashwood. Not a soul of all of my relations knows of it. Miss Steele, I really must protest. Oh, Edward has the highest opinion in the world of you. He speaks of you as a sister. I'm quite sure I can trust you with the truth. I'm not sure you can. I know Edward would want me to tell you. Edward and I have been engaged for five years. Suddenly the sounds around me disappear. Suddenly the room grows hazy. Oh, Miss Dashwood, how difficult it's been. It seems that all of time comes screeching to a halt. But still I must retain my point. Everything is in such suspense. But somewhere in silence my senses are wrought. Somewhere in silence I'm screaming. Somewhere in silence I'm dreaming. No doubt Edward has never mentioned me to you. His first care has been to keep the matter secret. Suddenly the man you really thought you knew turns out to be just a stranger. I have no doubt in your faithfully keeping this secret for us. And everything you thought has vanished with the dust. Yet I must appear unchanged. Thank you for your discretion. But somewhere in silence I feel so betrayed Somewhere in silence I'm falling How much can one so bear? How much is too unfair? How far is lost? What cost is there to pay for my despair? How mad I was to want for more that I cannot restore. It seems that I am quite the fool, but this joke feels expressly cruel. How small I am, I'm just a blur, now forced to keep the promise that I made to her. And somewhere in silence, why has he I'm forgotten me? Why fist. has he forgotten me? Somewhere I'm shouting, he has mentioned me. Somewhere in silence, I scream.
Portman Square. The memories of this house are particularly winsome in this time of year. Oh, girls, girls, you will dine with me at five in the hall, of course. London will do you both a world of good. We require your attendance at the season's most elite events, the borders and the parlors and the gossip and the slander. How easily we pander with the guise of being a regency. I really have missed London, where there is no common decency. Parties with bankers who drink too much port, all of their wives on a long holiday. Season after season, we enjoy the simple pleasures. Talking to a woman who adorns a shocking bed head. But this is for the girls, and we must not indulge our leisures. We'll always have time for that. Isn't it lovely in Boston Square? Dear Mr. Willoughby, I am writing to inform you I'm in London, have you noticed? I have been here for a fortnight Doing lots of busy nothings But once I see your face I'll know It was not all that long ago That you had your own has come back to me! Colonel Brandon, this is a surprise. Ladies, it is indeed a pleasure. And what a pleasure it is to see you again, too. Miss Dashwood, I trust you have been enjoying your time in London? Yes, indeed, the weather has been quite lovely. If you'll excuse me, please. Your sister seems out of spirits today. I do apologize for her, Colonel. She is unwell. Well, I'm sorry for that, for I wished to congratulate her. Congratulate her? For what, may I ask? Her engagement to Mr. Willoughby. I beg your pardon? It is very generally known. It cannot be generally known, for her own sister does not know of it. Uh, excuse me, Miss Dashwood, I'm afraid my inquiry has been impertinent, but I had not supposed any secrecy intended, as their marriage is universally spoken of. I scarcely know what to say. <coughs> Tell me that their attachment is resolved, and I shall conceal my own disappointment and wish them well. I have never been informed myself of the terms on which they stand with each other, but of their mutual affection, I have no doubt. So indeed, it is perhaps true. Yes, yes that is what I thought. Well then, I wish her all imaginable happiness. I wish her only joy and celebration. And may the path thereon be tranquil. We shall be forever thankful. That is very generous of you, Colonel. If you'll excuse me. Miss Dashwood. I see a girl from afar I see a light and a rare shooting star But my sweet Marianne All you see is a man On the wrong side of five and thirty How long it's been since a day I felt away and alive in this way but my sweet Marianne all you see is a man on the wrong side of five and thirty why should you look at me what can I offer how can I dare take your hand for there comes a roar comes a grace out of the blue such a rare change of pace oh my sweet 
Marianne In the corner I stand On the wrong side of five and thirty Good evening, Miss Dashwood Good evening, Colonel I thank you for the book you brought last week it was very thoughtful. Well, I know how fond you are of Keats. I am indeed. Personally, I'm lost when it comes to poetry. I couldn't rhyme my own name. Of course, I suppose it's, it's difficult to rhyme one's own name. I imagine. Unless one's name were John. I suppose that would be an easier name to rhyme. Am I still speaking? <laughs> Yes, I believe so. Uh, how unfortunate. <laughs> I trust your business in London has been taken care of. I hope it did not put your season off. Uh, no, no, my season is quite well, thank you. Yours. My. Season. Well, quite well. Good. Well then. See you tomorrow, I imagine. Yes. Yes. It's, it's as though I have nowhere else to go. I might as well be deceased. Old and grey or decrepit at least. For my dear Marianne, all you see is a man on the wrong side of five and thirty. Why should you look at me? What can I offer? How can I dare take your hand? But I wish you well, wish you grace. May you find joy in the future you face. But for now, Marianne, in the corner I stand with my heart in my hand and a slow loss of pride for it seems I reside on the wrong side of five and thirty since we went out. No, miss. Are you quite sure of yes, it? Yes, miss. How very odd. You are expecting a letter then? A reply? You have written to him. A little, nothing much. I see. I am sure he will come round any day. That is what you said last week. Well, what did your letter say? Very little. Marianne, I admit to being somewhat at a loss regarding your situation with Mr. Willoughby. Well, I am at a loss regarding your situation with Mr. Ferris. I have no situation. Nor have I. You have no confidence in me. A reproach from you. You who have confidence in no one. Me. Indeed, Marianne, I have nothing to tell. Nor I. Our situations then are alike. We have neither of us anything to tell. You because you do not communicate, and I because I conceal nothing. There you two are! Oh, Mrs. Palmer is arriving in Barclay Street and has requested our company on Saturday night. There will be dancing, music, and men. <laughs> I don't like to see you sulking about. It's time for some high spirits round here. I'm sure I don't know what you mean. At the Morton's last night. I've never seen you so unwilling to dance. I was tired. I, if a certain person had been there who shall remain nameless, I dare say you'd have been on your feet until midnight. <laughs> and to think that he was invited. Invited? Yes, indeed. It was not very pretty of him to stay away when we were all expecting him. <laughs> invited. He was invited. Didn't he get my letters? What was that in the drive? He's arriving. No, he's not. I always think he's arriving. 
there he is again in a carriage drawn by a fleet of six white horses. There he is again on a crowded street on a midday stroll by a churchyard gate. And he's on his way, I can hear him now, and he comes to me as the fates allow. There he is again, but isn't there? No, he isn't where he's supposed to be. Has he wandered off? Is there something wrong? Has he come to harm? Is he calling for me? But I hear no word and I start to fear he will not return, he will not appear. There he is again. when I was younger. Now I find them tedious. When you were younger three days ago. Do you think it would be rude if I went back inside and announced to the guests that this is a perfectly horrid affair? I can. Or perhaps I could just drink a few glasses of port and the evening might not seem quite as dull. Tell me, what are you looking at? Good heavens, he is here. Strange. Why does he not look at me? Be composed. Try not to betray your feelings. Perhaps he's not observed us yet. Willoughby! Ladies. Good evening, Mr. Willoughby. How are you, Miss Dashwood? I trust you have been enjoying your stay in town. I hope it's not too warm for you this time of season. No, we have found it rather pleasant. Have we not, Marianne? Good God, Willoughby! What is the meaning of this? Have you not received my letters? Will you not shake hands with me? Miss Dashwood, I hope you have been enjoying Portman Square. I have heard that Mrs. Jennings is a most generous host. Willoughby, what in the devil are you doing? What's the matter with you? What is this about? Yes, I had the pleasure of receiving the information of your arrival in town, which you were so good as to send me. Willoughby, I don't accept this odd behavior, and you're acting like you barely even know me. Willoughby, this is beyond repudiation, beyond what any gentleman would do. It's pointless. It's senseless. You will excuse me. And worse, it is done by you. Willoughby. Willoughby. This is not the time or place. I shall not have a moment's peace till this is explained. He has used a young lady of my acquaintance abominably ill. I wish him the devil with all my heart. He will marry Miss Gray, and that will be done. Miss Gray? She is stylish, but she's not handsome. Aye, but when there is plenty of money on one side and next to none on the other, men care not for such things. Let us never speak his name again. Whose name, Mrs. Jennings? Precisely. <laughs> Though I dare say there's not a bolder rider in all of it. My dear madam, I am sorry, but it seems that your pride is offended. It was not the response I intended. My dear madam, I am sorry, but I have been well long committed. And if that tiding has been omitted, I am sorry. And so I've returned with some despair all of your letters. And I've enclosed the lock of your hair that you entrusted to me. I thank you for that. Your most obedient, humble servant. Willoughby! There he stood with a glaze in his eyes, a dreadful surprise I did not expect. There he waits like a boy with a sling, with a snake. 
snap of a string. He aims and connects. Well, I, I thought I might find you alone. I'm sure you've heard the news of Mr. Willoughby. I have, indeed. And my sole reason for being here is to give comfort. No, no, I must not say comfort, but lasting conviction to your sister's mind. I do not think that is possible. Well, what I have to say may prove otherwise. Do you recall the night last October? when I left Delaford so suddenly. When you received a mysterious letter. Yes. But, but wait, I, I, I must go further back to a conversation we had the night we first met, in which I alluded to a young lady I had once known that in some measure resembled your sister. They have the same warmth of heart, the same eagerness of fancy. Who was the young lady? The one great love of my life, my Lydia. What a lovely name. We had grown up together and loved each other from the time I can remember. But my father persuaded my elder brother to marry her. Lydia's fortune was large and my family's estate much encumbered. From father to son, I will never cease to be surprised how easily men favor fortune over love. Was your brother at least attached to her? No, no, he, he had no regard for her at all. She experienced great unhappiness. Divorce and ruin followed. I was overseas with my regiment when she was seduced by the first man to show her any kindness. By the time I could return home, I found my Lydia dying of consumption, her two-year-old child by her side. I am so sorry. Of course, I promised her that I would look after little Eliza. I placed her in the care of a respectable family, and then in the finest schools. I had every reason to be pleased with her situation, but last February, on her 17th birthday, she, she suddenly disappeared. For eight months, she was unaccounted for. What happened? What I had most feared. A man with a tainted reputation seduced her youth and innocence, left her with child, promising to return to her, but never did. Dear Colonel, 
What does any of this have to do with Marianne? Oh, have you not guessed? Do you not see? The seducer was Willoughby, who then abandoned Eliza and took up relations with your sister. This is beyond anything I have ever heard of. It is beyond anything we could have imagined. There's no excuse for that sort of behavior. No place for it in Barton Park. If I ever meet him, I'll give him such a dressing he has not had this many a day. Was I wrong to tell you? Indeed not. I fear the news might make you feel worse. I cannot feel worse. You were not, then, engaged to him. Not in so many words, but we were bound to each other, wholly and completely. But surely his actions and words have proved otherwise. How easy it is for those who have no sorrow of their own to advise others. Happy, happy Eleanor, you cannot have any idea of what I suffer. No, I... Yes, you have something to say. Just as I thought. Nothing to say. Nothing to feel. No one knows how I feel. No one sees through my eyes. No one hears my cries of desperation. Not even you, sister. Not even you my light can know my plight can speak of my regrets no one breaks through these walls no one sees my disguise no one knows just how fast I'm falling not even you sister not even you can after all, you're falling quickly too. I cannot catch you, for the ground is shaking under me. Hold my breath as I drift in heavy waters. I am sinking in an ocean. What was I thinking? How I ache. No one reads my intent. No one sees the steady hand is shaking. Not even you, sister. Not even you can calm the tide. I know I've tried. There's nothing I can do. Miss Lucy Steele. Oh, Miss Dashwood, I should have been quite disappointed if I had not found you here still. It was so considerate of you just to drop in, Miss Steele. I suppose you'll go and stay with John and Fanny now that they've arrived in town? They have not called on us as of yet. <sighs> we were so disappointed not to see you at the Mortons on Saturday. Yes. Marianne has been plagued lately with nervous headaches, so we thought it best not to attend. Oh, I'm sorry she's not well. Of course, Edward was not there either, though he arrived in town with your brother and Mrs. Dashwood. Edward is in London? Yes. But he stays away because of the extreme affection he has for myself. <laughs> which he could not conceal if we were together. At present, we can do nothing but write to each other. But dear Miss Dashwood, I've now met the person that all my happiness depends on, the woman that is to be my mother, 
Mrs. Ferris. I did not know Mrs. Ferris was to be there. And how did you find her? Exceedingly affable. The moment I was introduced, she took a liking to me. Undoubtedly, if she had known of your engagement to her son, nothing could be more flattering. But as that was not the case... I thought you might say so. There is no reason in the world why Mrs. Ferris should seem to like me if she did not. I'm sure it will all end well, and there will be no difficulties at all. Dear Miss Dashwood, heaven knows what I should have done without your friendship. Mr. Edward Ferris. Ah, hello, Miss Dashwood. What a pleasure to find you here. Among friends. Hello, Mr. Ferris. Miss Steele. What a surprise. No, please, the surprise is all mine. Ladies, what an unexpected pleasure. Didn't know that you would be here. Together, ladies, can't recall what I was saying. Does anybody else feel like it's out in here? Well then, isn't it surprising? Three of us together, conversing, ladies. I'm really rather flustered, ladies. Is anybody thirsty? Edward, how very nice to see you. How ideal we're all together. How's the weather? I cannot explain my presence in as much as I would like to do. Please try, Mr. Words fail me, reason has all but disappeared, and I wish I could too. Ladies, Edward, I really must be going. You must be I don't know what the time is. But went. we too seldom see you. God help me. Ladies, Edward, what a pleasure. Ladies, Edward, ah, what is it? Oh, my God. inconvenience of sending a carriage for the Miss Dashwoods, but worse, that I would be subjected to all the unpleasantness of appearing to treat them with attention. But my dear, I am their brother. It would be bad form if we were not to invite them to stay with us for at least a few days. Well, surely Mrs. Jennings can spare them. My love, I would ask them with all my heart if it were in my power. But I had just settled within myself to ask Miss Steele to spend a few days with us. She is very well behaved, and I think the attention is due her. We can ask your sisters to come some other year, you know. And my mother, to be sure, is quite fond of Lucy. <gasps> this is what I'd hoped for and dreamed of, pinch me. There can be no doubt of it now. No more hiding, no more retreat and deny. This is an advantage we cherish greatly. What a perfect day this will be. I'll convey the details, we'll both have a cry. And she'll be so happy for Edward and I. Edward and I, with the dashboards, Edward and I, walking through town, for people to envy, and as we get acquainted, she seems so cheerful, that I take a breath and I say, there is something I can no longer deny, there is a bond between Edward and I. Edward. Edward and I shall 
I'll be married. Oh, I know I'll be engaged for five years. My Edward? Yes. My brother Edward? Yes. Edward Ferris? Uh, yes. <laughs> Mrs. Dashwood broke the punch bowl as she threw the candelabra. Though it missed her by a shimmer, its effect was advantageous. Poor Miss Steele had yet to know how far a sister's love could go when you're not the one she's chosen. The Honourable Miss Morton, the only daughter of the late Lord Morton, was the desirable connection on both sides. Then what did Edward have to say about the incident? No one knows, or no one has said. But I dare think Mrs. Ferris will cut him off without a penny if he marries Miss Steele. Miss Morton and her 30,000 pounds would be the logical match for Mr. Edward Ferris. You have known of this for four months. She told me in confidence last November at Barton Park. Four months. Good God, while attending me in all my misery, this has been on your heart. And I have reproached you for being happy. I could not tell you. My promise to Lucy obliged me to be secret. Four months so calm, so cheerful. I would not have you suffer on my account. But Edward has acted horribly. He is like a second Willoughby. He is not. I acquit Edward of essential misconduct. I hope he does marry her. I know he will. He will do what is right. I wish him all imaginable happiness. You cannot. I wish him only joy and celebration. He deceived you. And if I harbor some regret, I'm still so thankful that we met. Now he will marry her and they will settle down. He will believe that she is all he's needed. And I don't know how well she'll serve him, but I'll pray that she'll deserve him. Edward, so stubborn and so unfeeling before. Fanny is in hysterics. I don't understand. Mrs. Ferris offered Edward the Buckingham estate if he would marry Miss Morton, but he refused. Edward refused. He said nothing should prevail on him to give up his engagement. He would stand to it, cost him what it might. Our Edward. His younger brother, Robert, is now to inherit the entire estate and fortune. I hardly know what to say. Oh, I will leave you with at least the happier news that there was no material danger in Fanny's indisposition. You need not feel uneasy about her. The doctor insists she will recover. And I will toast their union as this is meant to be. I hope that they endure their change of circumstance. I will not raise my voice in disappointment. For what would be the use of fury? I will face my hurt demurely. And I stole
Hello. Uh, am I interrupting? Mr. Ferris. We were not expecting you. Edward, you seem always to be popping in. Do I? Yes. It used to be so delightful. Now it's just awkward. <laughs> if you'll excuse me. I go to Oxford tomorrow. I, I would have been extremely sorry to leave London without seeing you and, and your sister. How kind of you to call. We ourselves returned to Barton in a fortnight. Yes, I heard. Uh, that is why I'm here. Oh? I thought it best that I, uh, that, that is. Uh, we have heard about the misfortune regarding your situation with your family. I dare say the callousness of their actions is reprehensible. Yes. Thank heaven for Colonel Brandon. Colonel Brandon? He has offered me a living. Oh? Yes. A small parish in Belford. It will be a modest income, but it will suffice. Um, I, I think your friendship with the Colonel must have inspired his generosity. It is a testimony of his concern for the cruel situation in which your family has placed you. A concern we all share. Well, uh, I must say that I was stunned. You see, Mr. Ferris, everything is working out as it should. I'm not yet sure that is true, Miss Dashwood. But I am still hopeful. The unkindness of your own relations has made you astonished to find friendship anywhere. No. Not to find it in you. For I cannot be ignorant that to you, to your goodness, I owe everything. Mr. I... Ferris. Until when next we meet, I'll favor our accord. Our precious little talks were cherished and adored. And I will walk the frozen moors a thousand miles to the most distant shores. If once I'm there, the face I again. Never. Come, let us go back inside. There is something more of a wildness to the hills than before. The clouds are darkening. Perhaps we could discuss it over tea. Would you deny me my greatest pleasure of walking the downs? You have been fighting a fever and a broken heart. A small cold, nothing more. Marianne. Be sensible. Is nature sensible? Is music sensible? It's just a bit of rain. No need to be concerned. Rain, wash me clean, leave my soul unforeseen. Pouring rain. 
dead of night coming back to me. And he calls my name as my heart beats fast, and he lifts me up, we ride off at last. There he is again in the pitch black night, like a Shakespeare ghost, he has followed me. There he is again, yes, he's really there, and it's all been just an appalling dream. But it's over now, and he comes to me, and he takes my hand as it's meant to be. There he is again, there he is again, there he is again. Found her on the downs. She's unconscious. Oh dear, she's had a fever. A fever? We must attend to her immediately. I warned her, but her stubbornness makes counsel impossible. Do not give way to concern. Her breathing is uneasy. Her color is poor. Oh, she's drenched to the bone, poor thing. We, we must try to keep her warm. Do you think it's serious? We must remain hopeful. What if we lose her? That cannot happen. Marianne? Marianne, I beg you to recover. I don't think she can hear me. Our faith must remain stronger than our fear. We'll keep a light for Marianne, whose will is strong. As strong as any man. I do not wish to cause alarm, but I am concerned. Is there no improvement? At first I'd hoped a night's sleep might restore your sister's health, but we must allow for the possibility of an infection. That is the word I most feared. I'm afraid I'm losing hope for her recovery. Surely there is more that you can do. This unlucky illness makes every symptom severe. And I will try to soothe her sleep. Her heart is cleansed by tears that Byron's angels weep, and I'll read to her, God speed to her. Pa coming! Yes, dear. He must come soon. He should not come by way of London. I shall never see him if he goes by London. I am sure he will find another way to come to you. Who is there? Is it Willoughby? No, dear. It's Colonel Brandon. Willoughby. I'm sorry, Colonel. She's quite delirious. I, I must do something for her. Very little can be done. Give me a task. I will perish if I remain idle. Perhaps you could fetch Mrs. Jennings and Lord Middleton. They have been three months her companion, and now, as it seems, the danger is greater than we imagined. I will calculate with exactness the time it will take to return them to Barton Cottage. Thank you, Colonel. Darling, please. If you do not come back to me, I swear I shall never forgive you. Open up your eyes and tell me how remote I seem. How my words do not convey the depth of my esteem. Badger me, pester me, Marianne. There are things I should have told you 
I have told you not. Oh, what was I hiding from you? I have long forgot. All those fears, they seem so useless. Not even a day. Don't test my resolve. I will stay here till your breath is synchronized with mine. While my hand is holding yours, Mary Anne, I'm still waiting. I entreat you to hear me for five minutes, Miss Dashwood. No, sir. I have business with you. Then pray be quick, sir. Your sister is ill, I hear. I don't see that as your concern, Mr. Willoughby. For God's sake, is she in danger or is she not? I beg you to leave. Tell me, Miss Dashwood, do you think me a knave or a fool? Mr. Willoughby. You must be in liquor. I am not at leisure to remain with you longer. Yes, a pint of porter was enough to overset me. So it seems. But that does not explain why you are here. In the hopes that you might hate me one degree less than you hate me now. And why would my opinion be of use to you? I mean to offer some kind of explanation. Some kind of apology for the past. Why did you call, Mr. Willoughby? A note would have sufficed. It was necessary to my own pride. How sad for you. My business is to declare myself a scoundrel, and whether I do it with a bow or a bluster is of little importance. Then say what you need to say and be done with it. I am in love with your sister. You have an odd way of showing it, Mr. Willoughby. Yes. I'm afraid my love of Marianne was insufficient to outweigh my dread of poverty. But I had determined to tell Marianne everything. And then a mere few hours before I could speak with her, my aunt's discovery of a previous affair forced me to abandon what was left of my convictions. Yes. And how you will explain away any part of your guilt in that dreadful business with Colonel Brandon's ward, I do not know. Yet I am quite the libertine. So she must be a saint. Pray, I don't excuse what I have done. I am guilty at last. With an insidious past, I have mistreated her, misused and cheated her. But Eleanor, if I could do it all again, I would not be the wretch that stands before you now. You may call me Miss Dashwood. And Eleanor, I let my passion for extravagance eclipse whatever happiness I'd hoped for. Misery, now she is gone from me forever, and I have just my vanity to blame. It's useless, it's senseless, I can't bear to say her name. Marianne, Marianne, oh Eleanor, it is my last remaining hope that you will tell your sister all I tell you now. Yes, Eleanor, explain the misery I'm feeling. How until we met, I didn't know what love was. Finally, I have the affluence I wanted, but lost whatever happiness it heeds. My fortune is worthless if I am not who she needs. Mary. Anything else? There's 
not my present humiliation enough? No. But it will do for now. Her pulse is slightly better, considering the severity of the danger. Is it not a temporary revival? Her fever's been reduced. We hope she has turned a corner. Nay, I tell myself not to hope. But hope has already entered. I believe the worst is over. And you will start to soon see signs of progress. Oh, great hell! How is she? I fear the worst, but do not conceal anything. We must all be brave during this most dire of times. I am relieved to tell you she is improved. I knew it. <laughs> She's as strong as an ox, that one. It will take more than a broken heart to put her in the grave, I can tell you that. She's a fine young woman, and she did not deserve such an offense, even from the boldest rider in England. <laughs> and thank you, Colonel Brandon. Marianne will be so grateful to see her friends again. Yes. Reading poetry must have revived her spirit. I'm not sure she heard me. I am certain she did. I cannot believe I even allowed him in. Willoughby has suffered greatly. I have no doubt of it. But my happiness was never his object. And I have nothing to regret but my own folly. Do you compare your conduct with his? No. I compare it with what it ought to have been. I compare it with yours. Our situations have borne little resemblance. My illness has freed me, Eleanor. Whenever I look towards the past, I see some duty neglected, or some failing indulged. The unceasing kindness of Mrs. Jennings I repaid with contempt. To Cousin Middleton, the Palmers, and even Lucy Steele, I have been insolent and unjust. And poor Colonel Brandon, always there, reading poetry to me by my bedside when I could barely tell if it were day or night. My happiness always his object. But you, dear sister, you above all have been wronged by my selfish behavior. Your example stands before me, but to what avail? I am free while you stay always steady as a rail. You're my pride, you're my soul, Eleanor. I will try to live my life as I see you live yours. Live your life as best you can, I have unhappy news. What is it? You look grave. Nothing serious, I hope, Mrs. Jennings. Oh, indeed it is. My servant Thomas has informed me that Mr. Ferris and Miss Lucy Steele have been married. Ah. Oh. Perhaps a little sooner than we expected. Mr. Ferris has not yet received his orders. Are you absolutely sure this is true? I'm afraid it is. Thomas encountered Miss Steele in town, and she was all too happy to give the news of her marriage to Mr. Ferris. I see. Dear sister, engage your feelings. I will comfort you as you have comforted me. Cry, scream, curse their names. I will wait. No. No, this is all very well. I am, in fact, that is, I, I wish him all imaginable happiness. I wish him only joy.
Colonel. I thought I might find you here. What a sight to behold. Colonel? Uh, foxgloves. <laughs> yes, they are beautiful. Yes, yes, they're biennial. <laughs> they bloom every two years. That's what makes them so rare. Then I shall have more appreciation for them. As indeed I do for other things. Colonel, I have never properly thanked you for your kindness during my illness and, well, for always since I have known you. Thanks are not necessary, Miss Dashwood. I'm afraid they are. You have been nothing but kind and generous and I've been rather aloof and disagreeable for reasons of which we are both aware. Yes. Well, and now? And now, I would like to make amends, if there's still time. <laughs> Miss Dashwood, Miss Marianne, you have no doubt been aware of my affection for oh, you. hello. <laughs> Mr. Ferris, what an untimely surprise. <laughs> Edward, you are the last person I expected to see. <laughs> Mr. Ferris? Miss Dashwood, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, um, uh, uh, how are you enjoying the weather? <laughs> I find it very agreeable, not too hot. No, not too hot, nay, rather charming. Yes, it is. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Tea? No, thank you. I hope Mrs. Ferris is very well. Oh, yes, she is. Is she in Longstaple? No, my mother is in town. I did not mean your mother. I meant to inquire after Mrs. Edward Ferris. Oh, perhaps you have not heard. I think you mean Mrs. Robert Ferris. Lucy and my brother Robert were married last week. <laughs> yes. Funny story. Uh, <laughs> it seems my brother went to see Miss Steele several times, attempting to prevent my marriage to her. Luckily for all concerned, not the least of which is myself, Lucy and my brother soon formed an attachment to each other. And less so with me. <laughs> you are not married. No. <laughs> Lucy married your brother? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly the sounds around me disappear. Suddenly the sky grows hazy. Miss Dashwood? Mr. Ferris? Can you forgive my youthful folly and my unfortunate tendency to protect a woman's honor by keeping a promise, even after that promise has long been regretted? Yes, of course. I have the same unfortunate tendencies, Mr. Ferris. Well, will you accept my person for all the errors it possesses? If you will accept mine. One more question. Will you marry me and be my wife? Yes, Mr. Ferris, I will marry you. <laughs> and in a flash my heart is cold. I share my soul with you, my light. We finally unite as all the stars
that was a day. <laughs> Quite. I don't suppose anything more could happen in a single day. No, no, highly unlikely. Uh, you know, the, the chances of this, the same thing occurring twice on the same day. The odds are not favorable. I would not place a wager upon it. Nor would I. Very good. Still, it's not inconceivable. No, no. No, it's, it's, it's not impossible. And perhaps made all the more likely by the two parties being connected in some way. Yes, yes, I see what you mean. If, say, sisters were involved. A very good point, Colonel. Then, perhaps, something wonderful and miraculous could happen twice on a given day. And if I may be so bold. Yes, you may. In my eyes, you're a sight to behold. Oh, my sweet Marianne, could you look at a man on the wrong side of five and thirty? I would indeed, Colonel, in spite of how terribly ancient you are. <laughs> how long it's been since a day I felt awake and alive in this way. What a wondrous surprise to look deep in your eyes And to know we are bound by a love so profound Our senses revive from the good sense of five and thirty In a moment there's a sudden burst where I finally see what I missed at first And the things I felt now appear reversed Love's a wonder Love is all we will know Love can carry you away So the poets say, come what may Live the moment And a rare shooting star But my sweet Marianne All you see is a man On the wrong side of five and thirty How long 
it's been since the day I felt awake and alive in this way But my sweet Marianne, all you see is a man On the wrong side of five and thirty Why should you look at me? What can I offer? How can I dare take your hand? But I wish you well, wish you grace May you find joy in the future you face But for now, Marianne, in the corner I stand With my heart in my hand And a slow loss of pride For it seems I reside on the wrong side Five and thirty. I will stay here till your breath is synchronized with mine, while my hand is holding yours, Mary. And I won't.